trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. The morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saints of earth shall gather further on the other shore. When the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. Just over in the glory land. 
All right. Well, it sure is good to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. We went from summer to winter. That's all right. We're going to be in the book of Malachi uh, tonight, chapter number two. Malachi. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Brother Kerry. Come on up here, Brother. Brother Kerry's going to sing a song. He's, the, the Lord has put a song on his heart, and uh, he said he wants to, to do it not for himself, but to mind the Lord and be mindful of his spirit. So I said, well, listen, if God is in it, we want you to do it. So you make Brother... No, he's in it because I interrupted you. That's all right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's all right. I'm nervous. I, I can't help it. This song I really haven't sang before, so you, I might get the words since I can read them. But I'd like to share if that's okay for just a second. Uh, I've been going down this grief road, and uh, it's been horrible, okay? And when it gets really bad, I withdraw. I miss. I, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to be comforted in any way. I self-punish myself, and I'm done doing that. And I couldn't understand why am I going through such a hard time with this. And the Lord, he laid on my heart, you know. He forgave me. She forgave me. But I didn't even forgive myself, okay? I was married 36 years to her, and uh, 30 of them, I was a, an adulterer, a thief, a liar, a drug addict, an alcoholic, and a lot of other things that you don't know about me. And uh, I'm, when you want to talk about a change, he changed me, you know? He changed me, and I'm so grateful for that. I owe him everything, and I'm ashamed of those things, but it's powerful that he took them from me. You know, and if I could help somebody else understand that, and I, I know that's why I've been grieving like I have been, and grief's a, a, a weird thing. You think you've got a handle on it one minute, and then the next time you, you look and you're just a mess, I, and you can't even control it. It's, it's a crazy thing, you know, and uh, I'm just thankful that he gives me the strength, and, you know, I got up here because I, I love him, and I, I, will, I just owe him everything. Oh, not for him. I just, anytime I can stand and say anything, I'm not ashamed. And I, everybody knows who I am. And where I, well, I can't whisper, okay? My voice carries everywhere. But uh, I just love him. And uh, this is for him. I, if you enjoy it, that's a plus. But if you don't, that's okay because I love the Lord, you know? And uh, it's an Easter song. And I know some of you older people remember the Easter's, you know? And been watching the Ganthers and they just touched my heart you know and uh, it's a song from them and hopefully I don't you know tear it clear up okay Shoo. pray for me okay <sighs> lonely years I have lived in my life had no meaning till I heard about Calvary then I knelt down in prayer. The Lord met me there. Now Jesus, he's living in me. Glory to God. He's in my feet when I'm walking in my tongue, when I'm talking in my eyes. And now I can see he's in the song that I'm singing in my heart his joy is ringing Jesus is living in me through the valleys he has brought me to the top of that mountain and over life's troubled sea. Now I sing for his glory, a song to tell a great story, because Jesus, he's living in me. Well, glory, he's in my feet when I'm walking, in my tongue when I'm talking, in my eyes. And now I can see he's in the song 
that I'm singing in my heart. His joy is ringing. Yeah. Jesus is living in me. Thank you, Lord, for that. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. the Lord. Wonderful testimony, brother. Praise the Lord. I want to read some scripture that will go right along with what you're referring to and what you're going through. Uh, it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You all don't have to turn there, but listen. He says, the writer Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on corruption, incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law, but I like this, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Kerry, I believe tonight that the reason we grieve the way we do, it's because it's the sting of death. It's the separation. It's a part of what everyone must go through. But I'm thankful that death is swallowed up in victory because of Jesus Christ. One day, one day, bless God, we'll see those that have went before us. Matter of fact, my mom had come to me the other day. She was cleaning the church. I was in my office. She said, Mark, what would you do? She said, I heard this song. What would you do if you got to spend seven minutes in heaven? What would you do? I said, Mom, I would reject the offer. She says, what do you mean? I said, I wouldn't want to go for just seven minutes. What could I do in seven minutes? Because I know when I got there, I wouldn't want to come back here. Amen. And who would I choose to go see for seven minutes? I have so many loved ones that's there. My daddy's there, my mama, my papa, all of my kindred, my, 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 my friends, my loved ones. But most of all, Jesus is there. And why would I ever want to depart from his presence once I get to heaven? So I'll just wait my turn and not go for seven minutes, but go for eternity. Amen. That's the hope that I've got. Amen. Thank God. Anybody else tonight with a testimony for the Lord or maybe a song you'd like to sing? It's a good place to be already. Malachi chapter number 2 is where we're going to be. We thank God for Him. We thank God for His Spirit. We thank God for Him being present here tonight. Uh, I don't know about you, but if you have not felt Him, and I understand we don't go on feeling, but I'm thankful we serve a God that we can feel and I'm thankful that our spirits bear witness with the Holy Spirit. My spirit bears witness with you, yours with mine, so on and so forth. And I'm thankful that we can come to a place, Brother Randy, where we can all dwell together in unity. The writer said, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. This is just a small portion of what God's going to give us for eternity, Brother Jay. I believe that what we experience here, the blessings of heaven, the, uh, the, the songs that's sung, the tears that's shed, I don't believe that we shed a tear that God doesn't bottle up. I believe He bottles up all of our tears. Uh, he knows exactly what they're for. Some of them's for joy, some of them's for sadness, but I do believe this, that God is going to take care of everything because the Bible says, one day God shall wipe away all tears. Thank God. Anybody else tonight? Malachi chapter number 2. Speak now, forever hold your peace. This ain't a marriage, but when I get into the Word of God, we're going to go. Amen? Chapter number 2, starting at verse 1, going to read all the way down through verse number 9. The Bible says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yeah, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed, and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts. And one shall take you away with it. And you shall know that I have sent his commandment unto you. Now here's where I want to start from tonight. At the latter part of verse 4. That my covenant might be with Levi, 
saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 5, my covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me, and was not, or, and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according as ye have not kept my ways but have been partial in the law. Last week we refreshed a little bit about the book of Malachi and what was happening. The priests were allowing God's people, the children of Israel, to bring sacrifices that was not pleasing unto God. They was bringing lame and sick, and they became used to doing that because the priest was allowing them to do that. We talked about how that people... The children of Israel, and even yet today, people are doing things, and within doing them, they don't know what is right and what is wrong. For example, you can teach someone to do something, and this is why I said last week, um, I appreciate my childhood. I believe I was raised in a decent home, had a great childhood, but I also come to the, to the understanding that I wasn't raised right. Now that may sound mean, that may sound strange, but let me explain myself. My mommy and daddy didn't walk with God when I was a kid. They didn't take me to church. And they, in a sense, now I'm not by any means disrespecting them, I'm just telling you the truth. Some of us are taught certain ways in life that may seem right, but in all reality it is wrong. The world's idea and God's way is different. Matter of fact, the Bible says it this way. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, pastor, does that mean you didn't respect your mommy and daddy? No, I respected them. I loved them. But in all reality, some of the stuff that they taught me, and let's be honest, maybe some of the things that I've taught my children weren't exactly right. You know, we're in this thing, this thing called life, and we're trying to figure out what right is and what's wrong, right? But the Bible's very clear on what is right and what is wrong. A lot of people believe that if you'll just believe on Jesus that you go to heaven. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that you must repent to be born again, be baptized for the remission of sin. You must believe with all your heart. You must be saved. I mean, I can go on and on. These are the requirements of getting to heaven. I don't think that someone just stumbles into heaven. I don't think that anybody gets to grab somebody by the hand and take them with them. As much as I would love to, especially my children, I can't. As much as I'd like to grab a hold of you and take you with me, I can't. But what I can do is help you along the way to get there. Right? Right? And that's what God has instructed us to do. But here in the book of Malachi, that wasn't happening. They had forsaken the law. The priests, the leaders of the church, the leaders of God's people were actually teaching them something that was absolutely unbiblical, immoral, and a slap in the face to God. They were nonchalantly going through the motions of the law. And guess who they didn't hide it from? God. And now we come to chapter number 2, and at verse 4, I want us to take notice of something. This is really what happens when someone's taught a certain way, whether it's right or wrong. If they, if they do, and if they're taught something all of their life, and it be the wrong thing, guess what they'll believe? That it's the right thing. What does the world teach people today? 
Be yourself. Be what you want to. Be all you can be. If it feels good, it must be right. Right? But we understand, well, I've said this before, follow your heart. That's what the world will tell you. But yet the Bible says not to follow your heart because your heart is wicked and deceitful. Right? So it's not about feelings. It's about knowing what is right and wrong. Well, pastor, how do we know what is right and wrong? We have the Word of God. That's why it's important that wherever you attend church, whether it be here or somewhere else, or who you listen to, you better make sure that what they're telling you and teaching you is what thus saith the Word of God. Well, Pastor, you've got to understand that men and women interpret the Bible differently. I understand that. But there is a spirit that lives inside of you that will help you to determine what is right and what is wrong. Let me say this. The Word of God never, ever, ever contradicts itself. Ever. We know that the curse came from the law. He talked about the curse in the beginning of chapter number 2. But Christ, Jesus Christ came to do what? To deliver us from the curse. That comes from Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. But now we come to verse number 4. And he said that his covenant was with Levi. I want us to read that tonight. And I want to go down verse 4 and hopefully get all the way through verse number 9. But I want us to closely, real quickly, look at verse number 9. Or I'm sorry, verse number 4. He said, and you shall know that I have sent this commandment. First of all, who is speaking here? God is speaking to who? Malachi. Malachi is relaying this message to who? The priests. Right? Right? If you'll re go back to the beginning of verse number 1, he says, And now you priests, this commandment is for you. So this is what the priests need to understand. In verse number 4 he says, And you shall know I have sent this commandment to you that, you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. You ever thought about what that means? Maybe you haven't. Maybe you haven't studied enough or, or anything like that. But he's saying that he has a covenant with Levi. Well, what is that covenant? I want us to understand something, not that the covenant is with Levi, but the covenant that God had with his people and that God has with you would come through Levi. The tribe of Levi had specific responsibilities. And we'll read about this, or we have read about this, in the first one chapter and four verses. The priest, or the high priest... Out of the tribe of, of Levi, they were responsible for the religious responsibilities. Now, does any of you understand what the religious responsibilities were to a high priest or to a priest, a, a Levitical priest? Well, what was they doing? What was God's people doing and what were they bringing to the priest? Sacrifices. They were bringing those sacrifices. Now, God had set it up a special way. When that comes, it had to be a... The priest had to set it up, but that sacrifice had to be under a year old. Couldn't have spot, couldn't have blemish, right? And then they would take it and it would, uh, it would be a sacrifice. But they were bringing sacrifices that God instructed them not to bring. So they were nonchalantly doing things because what good is a lame animal going to do me? So their mentality was, well, I can't use it, so we'll just use it as a sacrifice. Well, let me ask you, when we do that, what was that saying about God? God, you're not getting the best, and God, in reality, you don't deserve the best. And you understand, God, that I deserve the best. But yet we, what we fail to realize is that God had given them the best. God had delivered them out of bondage. Out of the hand of Pharaoh, he had loved them, he had cared for them, and they had the audacity to think that even God could love them. So the tribe of Levi, or the, the priest, their responsibilities was to sacrifice these animals. Levi came from Jacob, and God's covenant would go through Levi and Jacob and generations to come. Let me ask you something. What is a covenant? Promise. Promise or an agreement, right? God made an agreement with Abraham, 
Isaac, Jacob, so on and so forth, all the way down through the generations. So what was the covenant? Well, let's look at verse number 5. This is where it gets good. He said, my covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. Now, if you read that, how it is written, who would you think that God had the covenant with? If you look at verse 4, what did he say? His covenant was with who? But in verse 5, it says, my covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. He says, my covenant was with him. Let me stop there for just a moment and tell you this, that it was not, God's covenant was not with Moses, it was not with Aaron, it was not with Jacob, and it was not even with Levi. But who was it with? Look at verse 2. Or I'm sorry, verse number 5 again, let's look. My covenant was with him of life. Boy, I'm hearing Jesus a lot. Nancy, you are right. Jacob could not give life. Moses cannot give life. Aaron could not give life. Levi could not give life. The only one that could give life and can give life is who? Jesus. So God's covenant wasn't with Levi, it went through Levi, and the covenant was with Jesus Christ. I love this. These first, these two words that follow is life and peace. Who brings life? Jesus. Let me ask you, who brings peace? The Prince of Peace. His name is Jesus. It is not Levi. It is not Moses. It is not Mark. It is not Jerry. It is not Jim. It is not Lucifer. It is only Jesus Christ that brings peace and brings life. The covenant made with Jesus from everlasting life called a covenant of life and also the covenant of peace, with peace which is Christ because he is the peacemaker or the Prince of Peace. The covenant that he's referring to was made with Christ and this is God speaking to his people on behalf of the covenant that he has made with Christ. Now you say, well, pastor, that's impossible because Jesus Christ hasn't come. Well, remember, they're under the law. And because they disobeyed the law, now they're cursed because of the law. And the only way that they're going to make it through is because of the covenant that God has with his son, Jesus Christ. You say, well, pastor, that still doesn't help them. Oh, it does. He says, now let, let's go down and continue to read. He says, my covenant is with them of life and of peace, and I gave them to him. Wait a minute. I gave them to him? He gave who to who? Well, no, 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 God gave mankind, God gave you, God gave the children of Israel, God gave Levite and all the tribes to who? Jesus Christ. It amazes me how the people that will be all religious and say, well, Jesus was never found in the Old Testament, but yet you can go back to the book of Genesis and read where he said, let us make man in our own image. God was speaking, but yet you cannot separate God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So that means Jesus was in the beginning the same as God was. And here we read the same thing, that God's covenant wasn't with man, it went through man, but the covenant came between God and Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the only one that could remain and contain and accept the covenant that he had with his Father. What, I'm going to tell you what, that will make you shout tonight. Notice what it says, my covenant was with him of life and a peace, and I gave them to him. God gave you to Christ. Is this on? God gave you to Christ for a covenant. 
A covenant was made with Christ, and this is God speaking to his people. God gave mankind to Christ for the purpose of what? What does God want out of, for anybody and everybody that's ever been and ever will be? To be praised, but to be what? What'd you say? To be saved. God is not slack, which means lazy, as some men count slackness, but he is long suffering, which means what? He's patient. <laughs> he is long suffering to who? To usward. God is patient with us. So listen to me. When you become impatient with your children, remember that God was patient with you. When you become impatient with other people, remember that God has been patient with you because it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the covenant that God has with Jesus Christ. How many times you just want to take your children up, your grandchildren up, somebody up, and just beat the far out of them? You all sit back here. Hey, my boys are 22, my daughter's 27, and there's times I still think about it. Billy's in agreement with me, ain't you, sis? My daddy told me when I turned 50, he says, you're never too old for me to bend you over my knee. And I believed him, too. I tested that a few times, and the times I tested him, it was when he was disabled. One time I remember saying something to him. I had done something, and he couldn't run after me. He said, I can't chase you, but I'll get you. He had a broken leg. And I'd run by him, and I'd stick my tongue out. And I'd dare him to get me. One day, I'd forgot all about it. He was sitting on the front porch. He had that crutch beside him. And I just nonchalantly walked by him. Pap! And he hit me with the crutch. And it hurt. And it didn't knock me out. But he hit me just hard enough to make it hurt. And you know what I did? I looked at him and said, why would you do that? He said, because I told you I'd get you. And he never forgot it. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like Dad? So now here in, in verse number 5, he says, My covenant was with him of life and of peace. I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me. Who feared who? Jesus feared God enough to do what? To be obedient. Oh, this is good stuff, I'm telling you. And was afraid before my name. It would go through Levi, but the covenant is with Jesus. Thank God my covenant, your covenant, is not with man. Let me tell you why. Because all the time, every day, men and women make agreements. They make covenants. Let me give you an example. You go to the bank. You sign an agreement. How much your payment's going to be. How much your interest is going to be. How long you're going to pay that. Some want, some may, may go ahead and pay that and be faithful in doing that. Then there's others that says, I don't want to do it no more. And you know what they do? They walk away. They break the covenant that they had with the person or the bank that loaned them the money. Now, I look at that, and I don't think God's very pleased with that, but that's not my business. That'll, they'll have to stand before God. I believe that you ought to honor what you have done. Amen? That was just a, a, an example of what I'm referring to. Jesus feared God enough that he obeyed and went to the cross to redeem you. What would have happened had Jesus not went to the cross? What would have happened if God would have said, listen, Jesus, the world's in trouble. They cannot live by the law. They're trying it. They've broke it. There has to be a redeemer. He looked under heaven, above heaven, in heaven, and he found none. But Jesus said, I'll go. Hey, thank God tonight that Jesus stood up and said, I'll go to redeem the people. He made that covenant with God. Here's the great news, greatest news about that. Aren't you thankful he didn't break it? Aren't you thankful that when he came, was born of a virgin, raised as a child, become a man at the age of 30, knowing he was going to die on the cross, he could have called 12 legions of angels to come and get him, but he didn't do it. He kept the commandment. He kept the covenant between him and his father. Thank God. Listen, because of that, you and I have eternal life. That ought to bless you tonight. Notice in verse number 6, you don't believe it was Jesus? Notice verse number 6. 
He said the law of truth was in his mouth. <laughs> and iniquity was not found in his lips. Wasn't the priest. They done messed things up. Wasn't Levi. Hey, his tribe done messed everything up. God had given them responsibilities. Listen, it has to be an animal. The sacrifice must be pure, no blemishes. But what did he do? Bring whatever you want to bring. He had already broken the covenant. He had broken the law. You want to know why? Because he'd rather please God's people than to please God. God have mercy on the man of God that will stand and would rather please the people than please God. I'd rather stand before God knowing I've told you the truth and you be mad at me than me to stand before God and making you happy and God said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There is a way that is right and there is a way that is wrong. And God's people needs to learn to stand on what is right and quit trying to stand on what is wrong because wrong never wins, but right always does. The law of truth was what? What is the law of truth? It's the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that is a remedy for God's people. It's the only thing that can redeem those that's lost. And he said the, the law of truth was in his mouth. The law of Moses was broken, broken, wasn't it? It couldn't be lived by. In this one, ver this one verse here, in verse number 6, we see the gospel. He says, the law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lip. Do you understand, for a man that lived to be 33 years old, never one curse word ever exited out of his mouth, never one defiled thought ever entered his mind. He never sinned against God. There was no guile found in him. I'm telling you, he was the perfect lamb of God. That's the covenant that God is referring to. It's the only covenant that will work for you and me. And hey, you know what? Even if we lived by the law and we did the best we could, we still would fail. We can't help but lie. Went fishing today. Did you catch any? No, I caught a small one. Ah, I was a pretty good size. No, you know, it was pretty big. How big was it? About like that. Knowing it was only about like that. The devil is a liar. Amen. He's the father of it. That's what the Bible says. In this one verse we find the gospel. And if this is not a picture of Jesus Christ and the gospel, then I have no idea what is. The truth was in his mouth. Let me ask you something. What does the truth do? I wonder, I wonder when uh, Malachi wrote and read to him what God was telling the priests what they thought. I wonder if they didn't try to argue with Malachi and say, well, I was just doing my best. I was doing what I thought I should do. I was just looking out for the people. Why would I take something good from them when they can take this lame thing and we can just burn it up and eat it up and all that stuff? But yet God, listen to me, God doesn't tell us to do something for us in return to come around and excuse ourselves on why we shouldn't do it. If God says it has to be this way, guess what? It has to be, you can look for shortcuts. Hey, there's a lot of things in life that I don't like going through. Truth be told, if we sat down together and I'd say, what, what bad things have you went through in life that you would rather not go through? I guarantee you there'd be a ton of our, in our lives that we went through things that we didn't want to go through them. But yet God allowed us to go through them. And guess what? When we went through them, guess who was there with us as we went through them? The Lord. God's trying to teach us some things. There was no iniquity, no sin, no guile was found that came from his lip. He never sinned. Think about that. Man, I struggle every day of my life trying not to sin. Preacher, you're a pastor. You should at least be able to go a day and a half. Brother Jay, I'll just be honest with you. It's hard for me not to sin before I get out of bed. Y'all can say amen all you want to, but I'm going to tell you what, that's what we deal with. That's what I deal with every day of my life. I am approached with temptation, evilness, the things of this world. 
Maybe my wife has taken up too much space in the bed at night and I'm grouchy at her before I ever get out of bed. Jay, what did you say amen for? He walked with God. Jesus did. Notice the law of truth in verse 6 in his mouth and iniquity is not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace. Jesus had eternal peace with his Father and equity and did not turn and did turn many away from iniquity. Can I tell you that's what Jesus Christ did. That's what the gospel does. Listen to me. You can try to feather your cap. You can try to smooth things over with people. You can put, pat them on the back and say it's going to be okay. But until you tell them the undefiled truth it will not help them. I found out the truth will set you free. The truth though it hurts it will help them. Because it sure helped me. It didn't only help me, it changed me. Now notice in verse number 7. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at whose mouth? <laughs> His mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. What's Malachi saying here? He's saying this, that the priests that are speaking or doing the position of the priests should do as God says, not what they want to. But yet they didn't do it, did they? They should seek counsel and understanding from who? God himself. Listen to me, I'm going to preach to you for just a minute. How many times when you come in a bind you need answers, the first thing you do is to call somebody. Got a few of you shaking your head. When in all reality, when things come in our lives, the first thing we should do is to seek counsel from God. Because see, God knows what's happened. He knows what's happening now. And God knows what's going to happen down the road. You see, those that we talk to, they'll only tell you what they know and what they've heard or what they've seen. They really don't know exactly what is going on because they don't know your heart. That's why we must seek the face of God to find wisdom and knowledge in understanding on what we should do. I'm telling you what, you come to me for counseling, there's a chance that I'm going to tell you to do the wrong thing. Because I'll see the hurt. And I'll try to want to help you. And sometimes, let's be honest, it's hard sometimes to tell someone the truth. Because you know how devastating the truth's going to be to them. But yet we'll step back and say, Nat, you know what? If you ever see me down and out and struggling and you hold me accountable, you make sure you approach me. Boy, just as soon as you do that, someone lashes back at you. You mind your own business. Amen. You, you, you worry about you and I'll worry about me. That's why we should seek counsel from God. That's why the high priest, that's why pastors, that's why teachers, and listen to me, leaders of the church should seek the face of God. Because he is the messenger of the Lord. Myself, Micah, or whoever need to make sure that we preach and teach. Whatever it is that we teach and preach is from the Lord. It needs to line up with the word of God. Notice in verse 8. Now God's getting serious. No one wants to hear this. I'm sure David didn't want to hear what Nathan had to say. Remember the story that Nathan told David? How that there was a man that had this one little ewe lamb, someone come along and stole it, and David, you know, he got all mad. Who is this man? What did Nathan tell him? David, it's you. As much as that hurt David, it helped David. It helped David to a place of repentance. To know that what he had actually done was sinned against God. Now here in verse number 8, he says, But you're departed, speaking to the priest, you've departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble. Listen to me, this is very important. When we cause people to stumble this side of heaven, we will stand before God and give an account because of that. I cannot imagine the times that I've stood behind this pulpit and said something or did something that caused someone to stumble and I didn't even know it. Pastor, you mean to tell me that you're going to give an account to that? That's what the Bible says. Every word that I speak for the cause of Christ, whether it be right, whether it be wrong, whether it was God's word or my opinion, I will stand before God. Well, why in the world would you ever answer the call to preach the gospel? I don't know. But I did it because that's what God wanted me to do. 
But notice he says, but you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. He says, you've corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. He says, you have not done this, or you've done this, and you've caused many to stumble or to do wrong. You've taught them to do something wrong, which caused them to believe that it was right. How many pastors, preachers, teachers have stood and told people, just do what you want to do, be who you want to be. God understands, he loves you anyways, and he'll forgive you. My, my, my. The Lord says they've corrupted the covenant. Look at verse 9. He says, therefore have I also made you contemptible. And base before all the people, according as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial. <laughs> First of all, he's saying you've been contemptible, which means this, worthy to be scorned or corrected or dealt with. Hey, let me remind you, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I could try to make you do something, but if I make you do something, somebody else will come along and make you do something else. That's why it's important for us, Brother Kenny, whatever we do, we ought to do it to honor and glorify God. I wonder how many men stand behind the pulpit every Sunday or Wednesday night or Sunday night and they don't study, they don't pray, they just get up there and just hope God fills their mouth. You know, there's people that actually believe that. But yet the Bible says to study, to show yourselves approved. How in the world could I ever stand up here and tell you anything about God had I not got my nose in the Word of God and sought the face of God on behalf of God for you? God have mercy that we use God in a way that we become lazy and with putting forth no effort and then we expect God to bless. Well, Pastor, what do you, how do you explain all these thriving churches with hundreds of thousands of people in them? I'll just tell you this, I'm not sure what they're preaching. And it's not my job to pastor somebody else's church. I've got enough issues here. Amen. God has me here. He don't have me up the road. He don't have me in a sister church. He has me here. You want to know why? Because you need me, I need you, and we all need the Lord. <laughs> I guess if you want to go to another church, you can do that. But you better make sure that's what God wants. Contemptible, worthy to be scorned or corrected or dealt with. He says you didn't keep God's ways and you only did what you thought was right. That'd be like me standing up here and saying, you know, well, I think the word tells us this, that you need to be saved, but it's not real clear. Well, well maybe if you just be a good person and, and you get baptized, maybe that'll be okay. Or, or, you know what, let's not even worry about that. Just come and be faithful. Pay your tithes. But yet the Bible, listen, I'm not going to heaven because I was baptized. I'm not going to heaven because I tithe. I'm not going to heaven because I've been faithful in attendance. I'm going to heaven based on the simple fact that by faith I trusted in Jesus Christ to be my Savior. That's it. The Bible says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I guess when I read this passage of Scripture, it reminds me of a man named Charles DeBoard. And he used the word often. He said, there's a lot of people that have cafeteria religion. They go through the line, and God has everything lined out. But yet, they'll come to this and say, I don't want none of that. And they move down the line, and oh, they want a bunch of that. You see, a lot of people, they want a bunch of God's blessings, but they don't want to give forth the effort to be blessed. We expect God to just be compassionate to us. Hey, it's as almost as if, God, I'm doing you a favor by even being called your son. 
Instead of realizing, God, without you, I'm nothing. You see, these priests were at the point, they just did what they wanted to do. God understands, God understands, God understands. But yet here the Bible says, Therefore I have also made you contemptible and base before all people, according as you have not kept my ways, but you have been partial in the law. In other words, they, you know what they was doing? They did what they wanted. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people doing what they want. There's times in my life I find myself doing what I want. But I'm thankful that God's big enough to remind me that I can't do what I want. That God has restrictions. God has rules. God has regulations. And you can call it what you want to. God has a road map. There's accountability when we stand before God. And let me just tell you this and end with this. The priests thought they were getting by with it. There's people today think that they're getting by with it. But can I tell you, God will always remind us what is right and what is wrong. I've said this, I'll say it, bef I've said it before, I'll say it again. Most people that come and seek counsel and say, well, pastor, is this right or is that wrong? Or uh, should I, can I do this or can I? Listen, you already know the answer. Don't come to me and ask me if it's okay to drink. You already know the answer. God's bigger than I am. Don't come to me and ask me if it's okay to, to fornicate. You already know the answer. Don't come to me and say, well, pastor, is it okay if I commit adultery? You already know the answer. Well, that's pretty stupid, pastor. It's what the Bible says. Yeah, there's a lot of things the Bible says that people don't see. The Bible says not to forsake the assemblings, but a lot of people forsake the assemblings. You understand what I'm saying? You can't say this sin's bigger than this one. It's all on equal ground when it comes to God himself. It's easy for us to get in that place where we justify our actions. But God says this, it's my way. Let me put it bluntly, it's my way or the highway. That's what God says. We won't have an excuse when we stand before God. I'm just honored, Brother Ted, to be a part of the family of God, the kingdom of God. I'm thankful that God even chose me, first of all, to be a Christian. But man, what an honor to preach his word and to teach it. And I do not want to defile it. I don't want to tell someone wrong. And you know what? I would hope that in life that if I have realized, if I've taught someone a certain way and God teaches me that that was the wrong way, that I'd be man enough to tell you what I've taught you is wrong. But can I tell you, Jesus is the only way, and that's right. Amen. Any other way is, listen to me, wrong. Let's stand. Don't know your hearts tonight, Brother Sam. Get a song kept over just a little bit. But those kids should be wrapping up. Don't pay no attention to them. Their faces probably are painted. They had black lights, strobe lights over there. They may have had disco night over there. Whatever. We don't have any going home with us, do we? <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> you just be thankful they're here, brother. Okay. Let's bow our heads. Brother Sam, play a song, I Don't Know Your Heart. Tonight, if you feel the need to come and pray, we want you to come. Uh, we wouldn't want to leave here without giving us all an opportunity to pray. There's a lot of things to pray about. Many folks need our prayers tonight. And uh, my prayer is this, as your pastor, that I'll always be found preaching the truth. Not leading you astray. Not telling you what you want to hear as much as I want to sometimes. I just want to hug on you and love on you and tell you it's going to be okay. But if I refuse to tell you the truth, am I really helping you? The truth shall set you free. Father, we love you and we thank you, God, for another day, another opportunity, Lord, for your word. God, forgive us of our shortcomings, our failures and faults. Lord, we, we pray, God, for this church, Lord, its people. Father, I, I pray for myself tonight. Lord, I need your help as a pastor, as a preacher, as a teacher. I pray for Brother Jay and, Lord, all of the teachers here, God, that are, uh, Lord, just giving forth the effort. God, would you give them a great desire? Lord, would you use them? that they would teach your people what thus saith the word of God. We pray, God, that you'd add into this church daily such as should be saved. And, Lord, we know that people can't be saved without the gospel being preached. God, help us to stand on your word, to preach the gospel, and to trust in you, Lord. Forgive us of our shortcomings, failures, and faults, Lord. Bless our church and all that we should do for you. Lord, bless those sick and afflicted, and God will give you praise. Dismiss us from this place, Father, but never from your presence. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.